A sphere geometry with an operator at the North Pole and an operator at the South Pole gives you an inner product in the space of operators. Uh, the cylinder geometry gives you an inner product in the space of states. Uh, this is called the cigar geometry, and it gives you an inner, it gives you an inner sort of a, a way to pair up an operator and a state. Now, uh, if you do a wall transformation that maps the, the sphere to something very elongated, you can convince yourself that this inner product is going to be, you can divide this inner product between operators as the map from operator to state, the map from operators to state, and the inner product between states. So, As long as all of these inner products are sufficiently well behaved and finite, uh, you can use this to give you a map from operators to states. You can say, uh, this operator, I, I claim, I, I related this operator to the state for which this inner product equals this amplitude. And also, this inner product equals this amplitude. So uh, you can take this as your definition of the state operator map. If you want to uh, map an operator to a state, you say, I compute this. This gives me an element in the dual. I compute this for every state. This gives me an element to the dual of the space of states. Uh, future states, sorry. A dual of the space of brass. So this is a cat. I can map it to a cat. So using the fact that the space of states has a, sem has a positive, has a, a non-degenerate inner product, you can definitely map every operator to a state just by computing this quantity. Um, and then if you can convince yourself that the pairing between operators is also uh, non-degenerate, you, you can use this to get an inverse map from states to operators. If any of these conditions fails, then your state operator map might be incomplete. You might be able to only map state operators to states, but not vice versa. Uh, right. Now, for a unitary, if this is Euclidean, version of a unitary theory, the fact that this inner product is well-defined is pretty much automatic because of something called reflection positivity. So unitarity in the Lorentzian theory maps to reflection positivity in a Euclidean theory. Reflection positivity tells you that uh, when, if I put an operator, if I have a conf any correlation function which is symmetric under some reflection, it's positive. So if I put here an operator, here a complex conjugate operator, I'm guaranteed that this is a positive number. So I have a positive definite inner product on the space of operators. And so it's definitely good in inner product. For non-unitary theories, you need to kind of check by hand that the inner product works. Uh, but even if it's not positive definite, But so this is the one way you can address the state operator map. The existence of the state operator map. And if you want to understand how do you go from the state operator map to OPEs, you can observe the fact that if I have some generic correlation function, there are two operators close to each other. I can sort of map the neighborhood of this uh, to a cylindrical geometry. 
So now I have a state created by the operator one. And then I'm acting on op with operator two. Uh, much before I do anything else. So here that will be the rest of the surface. So just by inserting a complete set of states here, I can rewrite this acting on that as a sum over states. Right. I can replace this bottom cylinder with just a sum over states with some coefficients. And then mapping it back here, it becomes the sum of operators. So you learn that you can replace these by a sum of uh, this whole thing with the sum of the other operators with some powers of z and z bar. This is just the same as inserting a complete set of states on the cylinder. And it will converge because this inserting a complete set of states converges as long as there are no other operators that come down to be earlier than this one. <laughs> so as long as you can draw a circle around them, around the first operator, sorry, such that all other operators are outside, and this one is inside, then the OP expansion will converge. Okay. So these statements are actually true in any dimension, just not just in true. And they're very important for things like the conformal bootstrap, which has some modern techniques that allow you to uh, study abstract CFTs. Okay, now I wanted to, right, also to make sure, do you feel you comfortable with uh, these vertex operators introduced last, last time? Uh, I'm not quite sure. But it's in conformal theory, vertex operator seems to be just an alternative name for uh, operator. Maybe an operator which corresponds to a primary state, so that has good behavior when the good OP is with the stress tensor. Not sure. So today we will need to compute, we will need answers to the following question. Correlation function of a bunch of these operators place the points on a sphere. Uh, how do we compute this? There are two, two possible ways. Uh, one is to just use weak contractions, patiently expand this in powers of uh, the argument. So I just write down the power series for all the exponentials uh, and take all possible with contractions. Uh, the, regu the regularization of the operator that we introduced last time is essentially equivalent to dropping all with contractions between fields within the same operator. Yes? Why are we interested in computing this? Because we want to compute scattering amplitudes. Which will have some momentum modes inserted in the external legs. When we do a wild transformation to the sphere, these have now vertex operators e to the i px inserted on the sphere. So that's why. So one way is just patient 
with contractions. It requires a bit of combinatorics. It gives a huge power series, a huge series in powers of log, logs of the distances between the insertions. Uh, but the final answer is quite simple. Just product of zi minus zj for different points to the power of true pi pj. Another way you could compute this is just by putting plug into the path integral. So you have a quadratic action, and you can just, these are exponential, so they sort of get added, get added into the action. So if you're doing a path integral where you have a quadratic action plus some extra linear terms in the action. It's just a standard Gaussian integral. You can just execute it. And you get the exponential of some sum of logs, uh, which is, again, this. So I invite you to do the exercise by, uh, by hand. But this dance that we need. Ah, sorry, I'm forgetting it, an important part. There is a momentum conservation. A delta function. Uh, one thing we, one exercise you can do is to check that this answer is invariant under a redefinition. Z goes to A Z prime plus B over C Z prime plus D. It's actually quite fun. So this maps the Zi's to A Z i plus B over C Z i plus D. Which means maps Z i minus Z j to something slightly more complicated that is C Z i plus D, CZJ plus D. And then there are some cross terms, uh, which essentially give you something like AD minus BC, ZI minus ZJ, right? Sorry. So you just get this. Uh, I'm normalizing AD minus BC. Now, when you plug this into here, you get back this factor, but you also get a whole bunch of uh, powers of disease, of, of powers of this, right? Essentially, something like uh, C Z i prime plus d to the power of two p i sum of p j, because you get one such factor for each difference which contains the i. Now, momentum conservation guarantees that this is the same as minus pi two pi squared. And if and this uh, is the correct factor because you because the Jacobian of this transformation is just 1 over cz prime plus d squared. And if you re remember, these vertex operators are supposed to transform with some powers of the Jacobian, which is p squared. Uh, did I get the sign correct? Okay. So these, these extra factors cancel out against the powers of the Jacobian. So this verifies for you that this expression is sensible and that this transformation law is sensible. So this is one piece of information we need. 
Do you have any questions about this? It's kind of fun to see correlation of functions, which are fractional powers of the distance. Although we are discussing with a free field, we are discussing a free field theory here. We have we found operators which have non-trivial anomalous dimensions. This is fun. Usually, to see non-trivial anomalous dimensions, you need to look at some interacting theory and do a randomization and, and all of that. But uh, this shows that even if in a free field theory you can find hidden some operators which have anomalous dimensions, at least in two dimensions. Also, in two dimensions, you have all sort of bosonization tricks that, that allow you to rewrite some interacting con conformal field theories in terms of a free boson. Uh, and then these kind of operators play a very important role because they allow you to mimic the, the anomalous dimensions of those uh, non-trivial theories. I don't know if you see anything like the Coulomb gas formalism, for example, for computing minimum model correlation functions, but that's an example. Okay. So another piece of information I need is the correlation function of correlation functions of ghosts on the sphere. To start it, I will really only need this correlation function. We can compute it in a variety of ways. Um, for example, we could map to the cylinder. Mm -hmm. okay. Why are we interested in this correlation function? Well, <laughs> because, for example, if I'm looking at a tree, what's the, the simplest amplitude I can compute? It's a scattering of one string into two, or the decay of one string into two. Mm -hmm. Say that I put a tachyon here. But really, any, any, any string. We saw that the, PS, the BRST cohomology is supported on things that are the form matter field, generic matter state tensor, a ghost, ground state. Now the state operator map relates the ghost ground state to a, an insertion of CC bar. And it maps the identity operator to an insertion of V minus one, V minus one bar G, which is sometimes called the vacuum, even if it's not the ground state. Just because it's conventional to call the vacuum the things that are related to the identity. Um, so conversely, you can say that it is ground state equals C1, C1 bar acting on the vacuum. So I might get I might have a wrong sign here. Check me on that. So in particular, uh, if you remember, we had, this, we had this relation. On the cylinder, which we can upgrade to this relation. Uh, which sort of tells you that you need three Cs and three C bars on the sphere. So that's something interesting. So do the, these Cs that you're computing now have uh, indices? Hmm? 
to proceed here has ended like uh, subscripts? Well, each of these, if you remember, the operator C is expanded as a, as a series of Fourier modes. Sorry, C of E to the A, e C of, on the cylinder, you get something like this, an S. Oh. If you map this relation to the sphere, to the plane, you, and you keep the Jacobian into account, then you get something like this. Uh, So what you can do is you can take this expression, expand each and every uh, C into modes, and then pick up only the terms which have 1C0, 1C0 bar, 1C1, 1C1 minus 1, 1C1 bar, 1C1 minus bar. Turns out that there are like 36 such terms. But uh, it's not that hard to guess the answer once you notice that the answer must be antisymmetric under exchanges of two Z's and two Z bars because the C's are ghosts. So the answer is just Z, Z1 minus Z2 squared, Z1 minus Z3 squared, Z2 minus Z3 squared. You expand this out, you get 36 terms, each of which comes from uh, one term in this expansion. I would like to also point out a fun fact. If you remember, the reason I justified the fact that this is, is an interesting uh, in a product is that these were the C ghosts for the gauge, uh, surviving gauge freedom on the cylinder. When the cylinder, there were these two vector fields, the less and the less bar, which left the ma flat metric flat or conformally flat and were globally defined. On the sphere, if you remember, I had something like the z, z the z, z squared the z, and the compass conjugates. These are the modes of C that correspond precisely to those different morphisms. So in a sense, the reason the sphere needs three Cs and three C bar insertions to be to give a non-zero correlation function is that there are uh, a bit more diffeomorphisms that you can gauge fix. And so there are three more B, three more Cs and three more C bars in your measure. And you need to solve them explicitly. Okay, so now we have everything we need to do this calculation for actual, for the simplest possible states in string theory, which are the tachyons, in bosonic string, which are the tachyons. So I want to compute the correlation function on a sphere of C, C bar, e to the i, P1, mu, P1, uh, mu, x mu, place the z1, z1 bar, and z2, z2 bar, z3, z3 bar. Okay? Is this clear? So I use those formula. I have no module to worry about, as I was discussing uh, yesterday. But, uh, so in principle, you can use a one of those SL2C transformations to map these points to three fixed points. Uh, so the answer should not really depend on the position of these points, right? As I said, there's only this, this surface is only one complex structure. It can be represented by a sphere with three points. The position of the points uh, should not matter. So which is, I'll do the calculation at generic points and we should see the dependence drop out if these are BRST closed. So if these are BRST closed operators, if homomorphisms are gauge symmetry, so I should be able to move these three points around freely without changing the answer. We'll see that. So anyway, I get just some powers of Z1 minus Z2, 
d1 minus d3, d2 minus d3. What are the powers? Well, for each scalar field, I get a product of the momenta. So I get something like the p1 dot p2. And then from the ghost, I get an extra 2. Here I get 2 p1 dot p3 plus 2. 2 p1 p2 dot p3 plus 2. These are the powers. Now let's use a little bit of kinematics. Uh, yeah, there is still momentum conservation. Let's not forget it. So let's use a bit of kinematics. We know that the momenta must all equal the square of the momenta must all equal uh, what for a non-shell tangent? Shoe, right? Hmm? The Sorry. The mass. That's right. The mass is negative two and. I'm using convention so the propagator is something like p squared plus m squared. So p squared must be p1 squared must be 2, p2 squared must be 2, p3 squared must be 2. But that's the same as p1 plus p2 squared because of momentum conservation. So I learned that p1 dot p2, 2 to 1, 2 to 1 dot p2 is actually minus 2. On shell. And so the dependence on the z drops out as it should have. And we're left just with uh, a momentum, conser momentum conservation as a function. So this three point scattering amplitude just reproduces the, the simplest possible Feynman diagram for three scalar fields with interaction strength one. It seems a bit anticlimactic to have gone through all the effort to find one, but uh, when we do more complicated endpoint functions, the answers will be more interesting. Do you have any questions about this calculation? So let's do something more interesting. Let's take the scattering of a tachyon of a graviton. So now I need to use vertex operators, which are uh, the usual ones for the tachyons. But for the graviton, I need to use this more complicated uh, expression. This is what I get when I apply the state operator map to a minus 1, a minus 1 bar. So you remember this is the vertex of the, the state I associated to the graviton when this is symmetric and perhaps traceless in a positive sense. And this is the corresponding vertex operator. So now I need to tell you the three point function on a sphere of this, this, and this. So again, you can get it with, from weak contractions. It's not 
uh, a difficult calculation. <coughs> Sorry. Although it's slightly tedious. So, uh, what you get is something that looks like this. Then the usual absolute values. Okay. And there is the delta. Mm -hmm. Absolute values of the z minus z one minus z two. Where did the contribution from the ghosts go? Oh, I haven't put them yet. So this is just the contribution for one scalar field. Okay. Now I'm going to add up all the scalar fields and put in the ghosts. So. When I do that. I get something like this. So I've already uh, done the analogous to this calculation to trade some inner products of momenta with actual numbers. Here there was a complete cancellation of the powers of z. Here, because the square, because p3 square is zero instead of being two. Now the, the, the particle three is now a graviton massless particle. Uh, I'm left with these residual powers. Now, I still have to impose transversality. So the fact that epsilon mu nu, p3 mu, should vanish. This means that because of momentum conservation, epsilon mu nu, p1 mu plus p2 mu, should vanish. So when contracted with epsilon, p2 is equal to minus p1. You can take the difference between these two. You get something like z2 minus z3 over z1 minus z3 times z2 minus z3. The same thing you get here. The final result is that this simplifies completely again. The dependence on the z disappear against these factors. And I'm just left with epsilon mu nu, p1 mu, p1 nu. Which is a pretty sensible interaction vertex for a scalar field and a gravity, right? If I have a scalar field, the, the leading uh, interaction with the graviton looks like that. So once I go to momentum mode, this is it. 
So at least we verified that when interacting with the tachyon, the graviton behaves like a graviton. <laughs> now, these are pretty much the only off shell, interesting on shell three point functions which you can, you can compute at this point. We could, I mean, of course, we could look at interactions between the tachyon or the graviton and some, uh, uh, some of the higher spin massive modes. But the, comp the calculations get in increasingly complicated and they're not very uh, illuminating. Now, although this calculation looks complicated, as you go high up in the number of external particles, this kind of calculations are actually much simpler than adding up Feynman diagrams. Uh, so, they seem because if you have, a, you know, if you think of, about the theory of gravity, it has already some complicated interaction vertex, and then the number of Feynman diagrams, even at three level, proliferates enormously when you when you have many external particles. Uh, the final answer of the calculations tend to be very simple compared to the incredible mess of Feynman diagrams that you need to use to compute them. These sort of worksheet integrals get to those simple answers in a faster way. And so they were the first hints that perhaps there are better ways to do perturbative calculations than using Feynman diagrams. So uh, there is a whole uh, industry now of how to do perturbative calculations in quantum field theory in, in ways that circumvent Feynman diagrams. And some of the interesting ideas came, came directly from, uh, from some theory or from hooking up some pseudo strain theories, which don't really make sense as strain theories, but still compute interesting, um, interesting quantum field theory diagrams for you. Uh, but it's an interesting subject. Uh, another interesting, a particular interesting feature of this kind of calculations is that the holomorphic and antihomorphic half sort of go along for the ride separately. Uh, the sort of amplitudes always look like I do some calculation on the holomorphic side and I combine it with some calculation on the antihomorphic side. If you just look at the calculation of the holomorphic side by itself, uh, these are the same calculations you find in open string, you know, when you look at open strings, and they tend to involve gauge fields instead of gravitons. And so you get, a, you get a somewhat vague impression that calculations with gravitons are the square of calculation with gauge fields. And this vague impression is actually also correct, literally, in, uh, in quantum field theory. So that there are some ways to sort of obtain uh, cut amplitudes for gravitons as a square, in a certain sense, of amplitude from gauge fields. Mm -hmm. But what does the coupling constant make? Hmm? Oh, well, the coupling constant, it's just the interaction vertices. So, uh, so the total, the total scattering amplitude of string theory uh, will be something like a sum over with an, an external legs, with something like a sum over the genus of uh, the amplitudes computed perturbatively with n external legs in genus G times some power of the coupling, uh, which goes with the, with the genus. So uh, now it's, it's a little bit up to you how to normalize the external legs, maybe in quantum field theory. You, you might decide it to, you know, when you, have a, when you do perturbation, when you do gauge theory, for example, you could put your coupling in front of the whole action, right? Or you can change normalization or, uh, and, and really Rescale the connection by G, and then you get 
one power of g for cubic terms and one power of g squared for quartic terms, things like that. So here's completely analogous. Uh, so anyway, the, you can just say that you have uh, one power of the coupling here, if you want. So you just put whatever power of the coupling you would put in the same and the same Feynman diagrams, one power of g for each interaction vertex, for each cubic interaction vertex. So here the amplitude, you could have said the amplitude was really the, uh, this time g string. And here I was, the amplitude was this times g string. Now, what you should ask is, is, is this particular choice consistent? Does this describe a reasonable perturbation theory? Uh, so in quantum field theory, what, what tells you if you have been normalizing properly amplitudes of different loops? What sort of basic self-consistency condition must your scattering matrix have, which fixes the relative normalization of different loop, loop, loops and different Feynman diagrams? It's unitary. Right, uh, unitarity gives you relations like if I take a one-loop diagram and I take a certain discontinuity as a function of the momenta, I will get a three-level diagram or a product of three-level diagrams. Or, I mean, there are all sorts of consistency conditions which, re which follow from just requiring that S as dagger is one. Uh, and these ones relate Feynman diagrams with different number of external legs or Feynman diagrams with different number of loops, right? V very basic things. So that the fact that uh, when I have a gra graph like that, it has to behave like one over the propagator times the product of these two graphs, right? So, I mean, you... As, as when the when the internal momentum approaches the own shell. So there is this general idea that if you can sort of cut your diagram in two parts and the internal and the legs that are propagating across are on approach the own shell condition, then that diagram should become the product of uh, of, of the two separate halves of the diagram. This is true in quantum field theory and is required by unitarity. The fact that, uh, yeah, essentially this. <laughs> uh, I don't know, maybe if, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, I, I would suggest you to go look on the Peskin and Schroeder or whatever quantum field theory textbook uh, you like for, for the unitarity of scattering matrices. Now, the same must be true in string theory for string theory to describe scattering of strings. So you can and should ask if this sort of powers of the, of the coupling and putting by hand do indeed give you, uh, you know, a, a reasonable scattering matrix. So do, you know, do string theory amplitudes like this satisfy a similar constraint?
So it turns out that they do. And it's not, it's not completely obvious, but it, it kind of follows on the fact that I can cut this tube and insert a, a complete set of states there. It's actually, they kind of follow from the OPE. Uh, this sort of statement, uh, and a little bit more thinking, allows you to, 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 re to realize that the scattering matrix of string theory is unitary, that all of these consistency conditions are satisfied when you normalize your amplitudes uh, correctly. So once I say that the tachyon has an extra factor of this vertex and an extra factor of this string, and this one has an extra factor of this string, this will fix normalization of this amplitude, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so to make sure that your normalization is correct, essentially, You'll compute this amplitude and then put the power put a power g squared in front. And to make sure that you got all the numerical coefficients cor correctly, you just go look at what happens when the sum of these momenta approaches the unshell condition for some of the intermediate states. And you better find the product of the true tripping functions. And we will see now. Because the next thing we want to do is precisely to compute the uh, scattering amplitude of four states. So, for simplicity, let me just take the scattering amplitude of four tachyons. So I send two tachyons in, and two tachyons come out. Now, in order to do this, I need to understand moduli. Because there is, now there is a moduli space of compressed structures. As I was telling yesterday, if I map this to the sphere with four points, I can parameterize the compressed structures by keeping three of them fixed. That eliminates the diffeomorphism invariance completely. And moving the fourth one. Now, my general prescription on how to compute uh, string theory scattering amplitude was that the measure for the integration of the moduli space was built by insertions of Bs. So, so what I need to compute here is an amplitude like this with these four states inserted and also an integral of B uh, the, well, I'm going to write it. And, and, it's, and it's some extra insertion, this insertion should be an integral of B as BZZ uh, times the variation of the Z bar, Z bar component of the metric with respect to my modulus. An insertion of BZ bar, Z bar as the variation of HZZ with respect to the complex conjugate. And this has to be inserted together with my vertex operators. Uh, product. So in particular, I'm going to have four Cs and four C bars, and one B and one B bar. So this correlation function still has a chance to work. So the total number of B Cs minus the total number of Bs is three. But I need to understand this. Mm -hmm. So why do we insert this? Well. Uh, I did, so I demonstrated it when, when, I, when we were discussing the, uh, the BRST quantization. Right? 
We're saying that when, the, when my gauge fixing conditions, when I want to have gauge fixing conditions which are parametric, meaning instead of saying I set this function of the fields to zero, I say I, I set a certain function of the fields end of an extra parameter to zero, and then I integrate over this extra parameter. Then the measure of integration for this extra parameter was given by the derivative of the gauge fixing condition with respect to the parameter. Right? Well, when I gauge fix on the general surface, I can say the matrix equals some reference matrix labeled by complex structure. This is the parametric gauge fixing because I've, I've, I have this three parameter which is, which is the complex structure over which I need to integrate. Now, so now I need to understand how do I so to represent the changes of the matrix that correspond to moving z. Okay. This requires a bit of thinking, but it's not too bad. So let me just focus. So the point is that, so let me take the sphere, a sphere with some fixed z1, z2, z3, and z4, and try to compare it with the sphere where z4 has been moved a bit. There is no, no holomorphic map from this sphere to this sphere. There's no map. So if I have a local coordinate z here and a local coordinate z prime here, there is no function z prime of z which maps z1 to this one, z2 to z2, z3 to z3, is globally defined and invertible, and it maps z4 to z4 plus delta. Because the only globally defined maps are these z prime equal to az plus b over cz plus d. These are only three degrees of freedom. Once I say that z1, z2, and z3 are not moved, that's it. <coughs> now, what I can do is to represent, is to use a coordinate which is not holomorphic in this complex structure. So that's the whole point. Right? These spheres have different complex structures. So if I make a map from one to the other, it cannot be an holomorphic map. But I can definitely write a generic map, which is not holomorphic, right? I can say z prime equal to z plus some function of z and z bar. That I can do. I can take this function to be proportional to delta. And I can take a function which is essentially 0 everywhere. except for a neighborhood, so I want function which is essentially zero everywhere, except for a neighborhood of, the, of this point where it goes to one. And it goes from zero to one in a smooth way in some neighborhood of the point, of the point in some annulus around the point. I can do that, right? This is definitely a map which maps this sphere to this sphere. Now, suppose I put a flat metric on this sphere. I mean, a lot, conformally flat metric on this sphere. Where does it go here? Well, it goes to the z, the, the leading order, it becomes to the z, the z bar, plus the z squared, the z bar squared, uh, Delta the z bar square del f over del z bar plus delta bar the z squared del f bar over del z. Okay, I just computed the z prime equal to the z plus delta del f over del z the z plus delta the left over del z bar uh, the z bar. And I also forgot a ter forgot a few terms, right? Because there is also a delta the z the z bar del f over del z 
and the delta bar, the z, the z bar, del f bar over del z bar. Okay, and that's it. So, what does this mean? It means that this sphere is not equivalent, this sphere with a flat metric is not equivalent to this sphere with a flat metric. Sorry, that was the other way around. Arrgh. Sorry, this was supposed to be here, and this was here. Okay, I took the flat metric on this sphere, and I rewrote it in terms of this coordinate, using this coordinate change. So this means that I can represent a, this sphere with a flat metric as this sphere with a metric which is not conformally flat, which has some ZZ component and some Z bar Z bar component, right? So now, so this is the metric. And I can compute the variation of this metric with respect to the position Z4. Right here, I call this parameter mu, but this was really Z4. So the z bar z bar component of the metric, when I vary z4, varies by the effort of the z bar. And the zz component of the metric, when I vary z4 bar, varies by the left bar over the z. So this insertion is really the same as an integral of b z z, just b. Uh, del f over del z bar. Okay. But now remember that del bar b vanishes away from other operators. because the equation of motion for B is del bar B equal to zero. Also remember that F was essentially, con was taken to be constant away from this annular region. So I really need to do my integral over the annulus. That I have shading here. And I can use Stokes theorem, I can integrate by parts. The bar B kills that, it is, is killed because the annulus is by definition away from all the other operators. I, kept, I, I drew the annulus precisely to avoid this point and to avoid the other points. So this is the same as an integral of the boundary of the annulus of BF. But on one of the boundaries of the annulus, F vanishes and on the other f is equal to 1. So this is really just a contour integral of b on a small circle surrounding z4. So that's the final answer. And then I get a similar contour integral of b bar on a small circle surrounding z4. Furthermore, because this circle is very little, right, very small, you might think that this should vanish, right? I'm integrating something in a very small circle. The only way it, it might not vanish is if this has a pole as it approaches Z4. Now, that this does indeed have a pole when it approaches Z4 because of the OPE. But the contour integral on a very small circle is going to only pick this pole and forget about everything else. So the final simplification 
is that this is just canceling the C ghost from Z4. So the final simplification is that while the vertex operators at one, Z1, Z2, and Z3 come with their ghost insertion, the vertex operator at, at Z4 has lost its ghosts. So I need to do this calculation and to integrate it in the, Z, in the modulus, which is the Z4, the Z4 bar. So this is what we need to do and what we'll do next in the next lecture. OK? We do this, this, this correlation function, and then we integrate it over the moduli. And we get to the so-called virazoro shapiro scattering amplitude. OK. And so this is the general rule for tree level. Three of the punctures are accompanied by ghosts. And all the other punctures have lost the ghosts, and their position is a modulus. 